Hello. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, the meeting went great. I think we're going to be set for the next year. What if the interruptions in life are actually an invitation to hear from God? How are we? Good. Awake, happy. Well, we are in the second week of a series of talks that we're calling In the Wilderness. And um, it's uh, 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 what you see in the Bible is that time and time again, God brings groups of people or individuals into the wilderness, into the desert, into these lonely and kind of forsaken places. And uh, it's not just occasionally that he does this, but he does this all the time. And uh, so I thought, how cool would it be to dive deep into some of these stories to try to make sense of some of our own wilderness experiences because we said that even though God might not bring us into a literal desert or a wilderness, all of us have experienced wilderness seasons, maybe a pattern of them, uh, maybe relationally or maybe with our health or maybe with our job or our life plan. Um, we've all been through some hard and tough, lonely and confusing seasons. And so um, this has been kind of uh, been in my heart for a few months and I've just been going through all these stories, made a list of all these times God brings these saints, these people that he loves into these hard and harsh environments. And the question I've been asking really is not even what we can learn because there's a lot in these Old Testament stories and New Testament stories. But I've been, I've been asking if you could take like someone like Abraham or someone like Moses or someone like John the Baptist or someone like David and have coffee with them and say, hey, remember that time that you spent all those years in the desert? Remember that season of wilderness in your life? What's the top thing that you think you learned? What did, what did you come away? What, what new truths did you find out? How did God transform your heart through that? And it's been really cool because I've never really approached studying the Bible this way. And I've been learning so much and I can't wait to share it. But this week, I want to start off by asking just a pretty simple question. Uh, how many of you have ever been in a one-sided relationship? A one-sided, okay, lots of hands, all right. Um, <laughs> a one-sided relationship where maybe it's with a family member or with a significant other, maybe you're dating or maybe with a roommate or a friend where you are the one who does all the texting and they don't text back and you're the one who makes all the plans and they don't make any plans themselves and you're the one who kind of carries the conversations and they don't really say that much. A relationship where you really do all the work and they do well, not much of anything. It's called a one-sided relationship. There's actually a term for this. I found it in the Urban Dictionary, which as a pastor, I do not recommend as a resource, but it's called um, phrenogamy. Friendogamy, like monogamy and friendship combined. You ever had something like that? Um, or have you ever had to do a group project, a partner project in school? Think back to that, where you really took your grade seriously and the other person could not care less. And so the first day you got the assignment and you divide it up like perfectly in half, like here's your responsibility, here's mine, here's what you're gonna do, here's what I'm gonna do. And you thought they were doing their part and then the deadline hit and you're like, dude, what the heck? Like, where is the, where's the research that you were supposed to do? Where is, um, where is that, that poster that you were supposed to make? Where's that visual aid? Like you didn't do anything. Or maybe it was a roommate 
where you uh, did all the dishes and you cleaned all the carpets and all that sort of stuff. And maybe the check even came out of your account and they didn't do anything. Or maybe like me, it's kind of feel like that with my daughter sometimes. They're in middle school. And uh, I will try for weeks to get them to say more than two words. Like just open up. How was your day? What are your life plans? Just look up from your phone for like five seconds, right? It's a one-sided relationship. We've all kind of had that, been in one of those. But have you ever felt that way? Like you were carrying the weight, like it was a one-sided relationship when it comes to your relationship with God. You can be courageous. You can actually admit that. I have. I'll be honest. There have been points in my life where I have felt like, God, okay, I'm obeying all these rules. I'm kind of doing all these do's and not doing what you don't want me to do. I'm kind of pulling my weight. I'm getting really serious about this whole Christian life thing. And you just don't seem to be holding up your end of the bargain. You seem to be a little absent, right? God, I'm doing my part. (laughs) Why aren't you stepping in and doing yours? You ever felt like that? Or maybe there's even a season in your past that you try not to think about that much because there's a little bit of anger still attached to it. Maybe a little disheartening feelings or some bitterness or some, some anger because you thought that you were doing your part and God either didn't give you something that you thought that he wanted you to have or he took something away that you wanted to keep and you haven't really been able to process that yet. Well, this week I want us to walk alongside a person who felt just like that, who felt like they had a one-sided relationship with God. But the story is really cool because in the story we get to see God kind of pull back the curtains and show us the person thought it was one-sided, but he shows us how he views that relationship. We get to see that relationship from God's perspective. And he actually does teach us that every relationship with God is, is honestly a little one-sided, just not the way that you would think. And it's the story of Abraham. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up to Genesis chapter 12. If you're new to this whole Bible thing, uh, this series is going to trip you up a bit because we're not going to go in chronological order. Uh, Last week we were in the book of Exodus, which is the second book of the Bible. This week we're in Genesis. We talked about Moses and Israel last week, but um, generations before Moses and Israel, God had made a promise to this, this couple, Abraham and Sarah. Uh, in fact, what God did through Moses and I- Israel was, was God making good on a promise that he made all the way back to Abram. Now, um, I will say that, that Abraham's name started off as Abram. Uh, his wife was named Sarai. God changed it to Sarah. I'm just gonna call him Abe and Sarah, all right, to avoid confusion. And we, we actually don't know much about Abe when the story picks up. Um, we know that his father's name was Terah, and he was the great, 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 great grandchild of Noah. I guess that's all of us, like it was only his family on the boat. But um, Abe is just your normal average pagan. And uh, he is, um, when the story picks up, he's still living at home in his parents' house. And he's 75 years old. That was kind of normal back then. So if you're mid-20s and you're still living at home, just say, parents, it's biblical. Because it is, it is. Um, <laughs> And uh, so out of the blue, God kind of shows up to this Abraham guy. And he hasn't spoken to anyone in hundreds of years. And so put yourself in Abe's position, the one true God of the universe, not all these other gods that you've been worshiping, shows up and starts to audibly speak to you in a vision. And uh, it's not just small talk either. He has big plans for Abe and he wants to share it with him. And this is what he says in Genesis chapter 12. He says, now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right? Imagine if this God you didn't know just showed up, like he said to Abe, and said, hey, I'm going to give you a ton of land and you're going to need that land because I'm going to give you a ton of kids and I'm going to give you so much blessing upon blessing upon blessing that it's just going to overflow to the point where the whole world is blessed because of how much I bless you. How's that sound? And Abe's like, sign me up. That sounds great. I mean, there is the whole part like I'm way too old to have kids, but we can cross that bridge when we come to it. Like that's an awesome promise. So what do I need to do? What's my obligation? And God basically says, I mean, just go. Just go and receive the promise. And so that's what Abe and that's what Sarah do. They, they kiss their uh, parents goodbye and say goodbye to their hometown. And they pack up everything. I don't even know how to pack for a trip like that. Um, but they pack up everything. And they, uh, they actually bring along their nephew Lot as well. And they head out into the wilderness. They start wandering into the great unknown. But right off the bat, 
This whole promise thing doesn't go like they anticipated. Abe probably thought it was going to be a short little one-week trip. But 50 miles turns into 100 miles, turns into 200 miles, turns into 300 miles, (laughs) turns into 400 miles. And right about the 425-mile marker, God says, all right, stop. This is it. This is the land that I'm going to give your children and you. This is the blessing that I've been talking about. Take it in. You're welcome. And Abe kind of looks around and he's like, Sarah, looks like a desert to me. Am I like going crazy here? And she's like, no, it's a desert. (laughs) And he's like, this would be great if I was like a sand salesman, but I'm not. So whatever. And then he also notices that there's also a lot of people living there. (laughs) So he's like, God, do they, do they know about this whole promise thing? Like, did you work it out? Did you just re-gift me like a used desert? You know, so he says, whatever, I'm going to trust him. I never met this guy before. And uh, he kind of settles down, sets up camp and, and, and settles down. And you might think that's boring, right? Just moving from the cosmopolitan life into the desert. What is there to do? Well, the promise part of it is lots of kids. So there's one thing that will keep uh, Sarah and Abe occupied. And uh, you know what I'm saying? The headache excuse won't work either, right? Because it's part of God's plan. So Every time Abe had a headache, Sarah had to say, no, 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 this is God's plan. You got you to gotta get with this. So after a few months of trying, they don't have any kids. A few more months go by, no kids. A few years go by, no kids. And this is awkward because Abram, his name means exalted father, and he's got no children. Well, a few years go by like this, and things get worse. There's a famine that hits. And so there's no food to buy from the people that live in the land. All the water dries up uh, for Abe's animals. And so he goes to God and he's like, God, all right, uh, time to give me a game plan. We were just chilling in the desert. Now there's no food. Just tell me what to do. You want me to stay? You want me to go? And God says, nothing, just silence. And Abe's like, I don't think you understand. I'm not one of your angels. Like I need, I need some grub. I need some sustenance. Do you want me to stay here or do you want me to go find food? What's the plan? And again, nothing, just crickets. And so Abe kind of takes his life into his own hands and and just goes to where the food is, which happens to be Egypt, 300 miles back the way he came. So he loads up his camels, he loads up the horses or donkeys and makes the long, long trek back to Egypt. But then when they get to Egypt, something else goes wrong. And it's because of a really important detail I forgot to mention at the beginning. Sarah, his wife, is a stone-cold fox. She is apparently incredibly attractive, like absolutely stunningly beautiful. So much so that Abraham just knows that every man in Egypt all the way up to Pharaoh will be willing to kill him so that they get to take her as their wife. Now remember, she's 70 years old. So I don't know what skincare routine or multivitamins, like that's some syndrome complete there. But um, Abe knows this, so he does the courageous husband thing, right? He gets out his, his sharpest weapons. He gets his most courageous fighters around him. And he looks Sarah in the eyes and he says, hey, baby, just want to let you know that I'm going to defend your honor until my dying breath. Ain't no man going to come between me and you and our undying love. No, that's not what he does at all. He actually looks her in the eye and he says, hey, if some guy wants to take you, could you maybe just tell him that I'm your brother? That way they won't kill me. That's actually what he says. And, uh, That's what really happens. Uh, Pharaoh finds 70, 75-year-old Sarah, drop-dead gorgeous, and says, hey, can I have her as my wife? And Abe's like, sure, she's my little sister, go for it. And uh, he takes Sarah (laughs) into his courts. Uh, We don't think that Pharaoh and Sarah had enough time to get to know each other because God intervenes really quickly. He sends all these plagues on Pharaoh's house. And Pharaoh's no idiot. He's like, as soon as I brought that drop dead gorgeous lady in my house, all this stuff started going wrong. So it's you. And she finally admits, yeah, we're actually married. And so he kicks Sarah out and uh, he actually gives Abe and Sarah a bunch of money, like tell your God not to hurt us anymore. And he kicks them out of Egypt right as the famine's ending. This is me summarizing chapter 12, 13, 14. And uh, now Abe is at a, a different crossroads. Now he's 300 miles from the promised land that God said that he would give him. And now he's got a super angry wife just staring at him like, where should we go now, big brother, right? And so he has to make this decision. Does he stay in Egypt or does he go back? And so he he goes back 300 miles on foot. He's traveled about 1,000 miles so far. But things get even worse when he gets back. There's actually a few things. Probably the worst thing that happens in chapter 14 is a war breaks out. 
And these five kingdoms kind of come. They, Abe's kind of set up camp around the Sodom and Gomorrah and stuff. And so these kingdoms come in and uh, they take over the land. They um, infiltrate all the cities. They ransack them. They take all the riches. They kidnap all the people and head out of town. They overlook Abram, though, because they're like, what idiot would live in the desert? So he doesn't get kidnapped. But guess who's kidnapped along with all the people? Lot. So Abe's nephew, Lot, is kidnapped. And as soon as Abe hears this, he's like, okay. There's no way God's going to trust me with my own kid if I can't even keep my adult nephew safe. And so, man, I just, if you read chapter 14, it's a crazy chapter, but I just kind of visualize Abe turning into like the Hulk or to like William Wallace, you know, because it's been, it's nine year point at this point. So it's been nine long years where he's just been getting angrier and angrier and he's about to bubble over. And I just see him gathering his men saying, they may take our land, right? And they may take our wives, but they will never take our nephews, right? And so he rounds up 318 men. It's a very specific number, but it's a really low number to go against the warriors of five kingdoms. But like, you don't want to mess with Abe at this point. He's had, he's had sand in his underwear for nine years and he's just been <laughs> stewing and getting angrier and angrier. And he storms into the enemy camps and just destroys everyone. Like, this is for my saddle sores and this is for all the sand and this is for my numbskull nephew and he absolutely obliterates the troops. He, he gets back all of the riches and all of the people, including his nephew Lot. He brings it back. He hands over all those riches, doesn't keep any for himself. And now Lot is safe and sound. <laughs> now stop. That's just three chapters. Um, that's just the first 10 years of his life. He doesn't know it, but he's got 15 more years to go. Chapter 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 21 until he gets the first part of the promise, which is a son. And if you notice, if you actually read the story from the point that God asked him to leave and gave him a promise way back in chapter 12 until now, God hasn't said a word. He hadn't been, he's been completely silent. And from Abe's point of view, not only has he not opened his mouth, but he hasn't lifted a finger to help or to intervene either. And so one day, Abe's kind of sitting in a tent in the desert. This is where chapter 15 kicks off. And he kind of has this crisis. He kind of starts having these thoughts like, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> this was supposed to be a quick transaction. I go on a little journey, then I get kids and I get a land and I get all this blessing stuff. Like I do my part, God does his. This is how this is supposed to work. Not this, right? Not 10 years of wandering around in the desert where God's kind of treating me like the celery on a hot wing plate, right? You just overlook it and like he's not even there. And not only is he angry at God and feels like he's been betrayed a little bit, but there's also a fear inside of his heart. You're going to see it in the conversation we read. He's afraid, like, the 10 years that he's been in the wilderness have been a lot harder than he thought. And he's not sure how much longer he can keep waiting. He's not sure how much, how much longer his courage and his resolve is going to last. I mean, for 10 years, he's had the daily disappointment of childlessness. And some of you know the pain of that. He's gone through a famine. He's angered the most powerful people in the world, the most powerful person in the world, Pharaoh. He's done a thousand miles of hard travel. He just went into battle at the, at the risk of his life. And what's going on in his heart right now is this weird thing where he's saying, Lord, I, maybe I don't think that you're keeping your end of the bargain. Maybe you will one day, but I'm getting to a point where I don't think that I can keep up my end of the bargain either. You ever been there? Where it just seems like God is, is taking an incredibly long time to fulfill something that you're really sure that he wants for you, but the longer he waits, the harder it is to stay faithful. Like the longer this lasts, the harder it is to just keep going, right? And it's this, I've been there, it's this weird mixture of feeling in one way that God's let you down, but there's also this fear that you're gonna let God down soon, right? And that's where Abe's at. And God knows and so for the first time in 10 years, he kind of walks over and he sits down and he says, all right, Abe, let's, let's talk about this. And it's in chapter 15. I'll read it kind of quickly. But it says, after these things, the word, in that cute, these things, all those things I just talked about, just these things. Um, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. 
But Abram said, yeah, about that, about all those promises. Uh, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, like some second cousin, not my own son. Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look towards heaven and number the stars, and if you're able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And underline this verse, we're going to come back to it. And he, a believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you up out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abraham said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And all, like bubbling up through this whole conversation is Abe saying, okay, God, you keep saying that you're going to uphold your end of the bargain, but you got to give me something to work with. Like all you've given me to work with is these promises and I don't, we're just, we're new at this whole relationship thing. I don't know if I can trust you. You got to give me some proof, some sort of evidence that you're not just a promise maker, but you're actually a promise keeper. And if I just had that, if I just had some proof that you were good for these promises that you're making me, then the anger will go away. Then the bitterness will go away. Then the fear will go away. Then I could have the courage. Then I could have the hope. Then I could have kind of the strength to carry forward. And God does something so kind in the next few verses. He basically says, like, Abe, it's obvious we just met because you have no idea who I am. (laughs) And you have no idea what a relationship with me is like. It is so different than any other relationship you've ever had. And I knew that you had the wrong idea of what a relationship with me was like when you headed into the wilderness. And I kind of kept you here for a while so that you could kind of process it and put words to it. Now we can work on it. But he says, you think... Your relationship with me is like with, with one of the other gods you used to worship. Like you do these things and then the God kind of pays you back in return. You got to sacrifice, follow the rules, and the God's going to pay you back. Or you think this is like just a normal business relationship where you uphold your part of the contract and I'll uphold mine. That's where this anger is coming from. That's where this fear of failure is coming from. What he says is basically a relationship with me is different than any other relationship you've ever been in in your entire life. And it's the same for us. And you need to know how different it really is. So I want to show you. And so he says this in verse 9. He said to him, bring me a heifer, a cow, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And to us, there's like, this is a weird soup. What in the world is going on? But Abram knows exactly what God's doing. He's going to um, formalize a contract. So back in those days, you would do this. I'm going to read it. Um, that you would do this during a, uh, before a marriage. So if you, some of you are engaged, are young adults, I don't think you want to do this, but you could do it. It'd be awesome. Um, it, kings would do it. Servants would do it. Uh, business partners would do it. But what you would do is you would take all of these animals and you would cut them directly in half. It's actually why we still use the term cutting a contract today. So they would cut these animals in half and they would line up half of the halves of the carcasses on one side of a little path and they take the other dead bodies and they would line them up on the other side of the path. Sorry if you're squeamish. And all the blood and uh, all the juices and stuff would kind of go on the path. And then the two parties of the, of the covenant would walk through this path together. They walk down it. Basically symbolizing, hey, if I don't uphold my part of this covenant, you can treat me like those animals. You can kill me. And if you don't uphold your part of the covenant, I'm going to treat you like those animals. I'm going to kill you. So it is a blood oath. And so Abram knows what's going on. And so he just starts to get busy. He said, okay. Verse 10, and he brought them all these. And he cut them in half. And he laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, it's a funny uh, scene. Abram drove them away. Shoo, shoo, me and God are doing a covenant here. And the sun was going down. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Again, even the covenant is not working out like Abram expected it. God's taken his sweet time. He's like, come on, can't stay out here all night. we got a covenant to, to do. But, so, but something different is happening. See, God forces Abe to go to sleep. He, he makes him, he brings him to a place of powerlessness where he can't do anything. And this is not how covenants work, right? Abe needs to be awake. He needs to walk through it with God. He needs to agree to his part. God needs to agree to this part. But he causes him to sleep because that's not how this contract would work because that's not how a relationship with God works. This is no ordinary covenant and it's no ordinary relationship. And it says this in verse 17, when the sun had gone down 
and it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Keep the verses up. Um, the smoking fire pot, it's where you kept coals. It was a small little pot that you would put a coal in to take to your next campsite, and it would smoke. It, the ember would cause all this smoke to rise. And then you had a flaming torch. Now, remember in Exodus, how did God lead the Israelites? Well, it was with a cloud by day and a flaming torch, a pillar of fire by, ne- by night. So this is symbolizing the presence of God. And so this torch and this, um, this pot kind of passes through these pieces. And it says this, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring not I will give, but I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates, which incidentally is actually where the Garden of Eden was. But who walks through this? Who walks through this, this little trail in the covenant? It's not Abe. And it's not Abe and God, it's God, and it's God alone. And he's saying, Abe, this this relationship that we have, it is categorically different than any relationship you have ever experienced or will ever experience. It is, you've been feeling like it's a one-sided relationship, it kind of is. (laughs) But it just all falls on me. Like if I don't keep my end of the bargain, if I don't give you the land, if I don't give you the kids, if I don't bless you so much the whole world is blessed, I'll give up my life. And if you don't keep up your end of the bargain, if you fail, if you falter, if you give up the faith, if you sin, well, guess what? I will give up my life as well. I'll pay the debt that that you owe. See, this is not a you do part, you do your part and I'll do mine. This is a, I'm going to uphold both ends of the contract. What God's saying here is the promise is not built on what you do and I do together. The promise is built on me. The promise is secure because it doesn't depend on you. I'm going to do everything needed to bring you into the promise. All you have to do is just believe me and receive it. That's it. That's how this relationship works. And you have to hand it to Abe because he does believe him. He takes God at his word. He says, okay, I'm, I'm going to believe you and I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to choose to believe that you're not just a promise maker, but you're also a promise keeper without any proof, really, without any hard evidence. What did the text say? Abe, uh, he believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. Now, after this crisis in chapter 15, It's a wild ride. You guys should really read your Bible. It's fun. Um, And Abe has his moments. He lies again about Sarah. You think he would have learned once? And he, he falters and he fails and he doesn't live a perfect life, but he never again doubts that God's gonna make good on his promise. And you finally get to chapter 21 and it's this beautiful scene. It says this, verse one, the Lord, this is 25 years later, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had what? Promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. Isaac means he laughs. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears me will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I've borne him a son in his old age. And it's this beautiful scene. My question is this. Do you think that if Abraham could have seen that scene with his own eyes, in that that crisis moment of chapter 15, if God could have just given him a vision and he could have seen little Isaac just laying in Sarah's lap and the goo-goo-ga-ga and the laughter, right? And, And just the joy and the thankfulness and the gratefulness and just the happiness that he felt. You think that if he, he could have seen that scene and experienced that, that that would have changed how he felt and responded in that crisis moment in chapter 15? Yeah, I think so. Like if he could have seen that, I mean, all that anger that he felt, the illusion that God was letting him down, all those fears that he had that he might let God down, if he could have just seen God make good on his promise, right? All of that would have just gone away. And here's why I say this. Because this is where it gets cool. We have something that Abe didn't. We can do something that Abe couldn't do. See, where Abe had to look forward in faith, he just had to trust in the unseen. Where he had to look forward in faith, 
we actually get to look back in faith and see rock-solid proof that God is a promise keeper. Abe had no evidence. We absolutely have evidence of God's faithfulness and his goodness because thousands of years after Abraham, but 2,000 years ago for us, God kept his end of the covenant that he made to Abe all those years ago, right? Because Abe failed, and every single human being after him had failed, and you failed, and you failed, and you failed, and I failed to keep our end of the bargain because we effectively failed ourselves out of the possibility of receiving the promise God sent his son, Jesus, who lived the perfect life that we failed to live, who died the death that you deserve to die because you failed. He took your place and he paid the price that we owed. He purchased our forgiveness and right standing with God by his own blood. He bought us away back into the promise. And three days later, he rose from the grave. He came back to life, proving that no amount of sin and no amount of failure, nothing, not even death, will stop God from being the promise maker and the promise keeper that he is. You see, see we know, we get, we can see that the, the, the truth that God was trying to show to Abram, that he was trying to display to him through the covenant, it's the same message we have in Jesus. The, the message of Jesus is not do this and do that, The message of Jesus is it's already been done. And whenever you get that feeling deep inside your heart, when you're kind of alone in the wilderness and God doesn't seem to be moving at the speed that you want and you get this this feeling that God's letting you down, that he may never make good on his promise or that feeling of fear that maybe you've let God down. Or maybe you flunked your way out of the promises that he wanted to give you. All you have to do is look back at the cross and look back at the resurrection. You just have to look back and see a God who withholds nothing from those that he loves. Not even his own son. A God that extravagantly gives. And also a God that does not hold our sin and our failures against us. Nothing we can do can get us out of the promise. We get the promise the same way Abe did, which is how. We just believe and we receive it, right? That's the type of faith we get to have. Faith that's based on a God who dies and a God who brings life back from the dead is willing and is able to keep his promises. So I don't know where you're at. Maybe God allowed you to tune in or brought you to one of our campuses or here right now just to remind you Maybe you've been waiting for some promise that you just know God has for you and it's taken a long time. It's been a year. It's been five years. It's been 10. It's been 20. It's been 30. And you're about to give up hope. Don't. It took Abraham, what, 25 years? And we'll see in other people's lives it takes much longer. First Peter says, even though it takes a while, he's not slow in keeping his promises, as some say. So don't give up hope keep the faith. Or maybe the reason that you're here, the reason that God brought you in here is because um, you've been approaching this whole relationship with God the wrong thing, the wrong way. You've been approaching it like every other relationship. Maybe you went to church a few times when you were younger. Maybe you went to church with grandma at Easter and at Christmas, and you just heard God's good and you're bad. And so you've been trying to be good so that the good God will like bad you. And you got some sleepless nights because you don't know if he'll accept you. And it's been this up and down relationship. We hear these stories all the time. I grew up in church. I thought I knew about Jesus, but it wasn't until I came here to hope. It wasn't until I went to this church over here that I really heard grace, that I really understood the gospel, that I really formed a biblical relationship with God. And maybe God brought you here just so that you can know, so that you can start a relationship like that right now. So that you don't have to be afraid that you can start a real relationship. Or maybe you walked in here And a relationship with God sounds pretty good to you, but you're pretty sure that God doesn't want that sort of relationship with you because you've done some bad stuff. And you failed in the past and you're pretty sure that you're gonna fail in the future. And what you need to hear today is that it does not depend on what you do or don't do. It depends on what Jesus did and didn't do. And that nothing is blocking the way from you stepping into the promise relationship with him, transformation, forgiveness, mercy, grace, eternity with him. All you have to do is believe. And so if that's you, I want to give you a chance across all of our campuses, online, in the room right now. We could just bow our heads and close our eyes. If that's you, maybe you've been approaching your relationship wrong. 
and maybe the gospel or grace just clicked or maybe you've never started a relationship, maybe just pray a prayer like this. I want to invite you. Just say something like, Father, I know that I've failed and I feel that. But you say that you'll forgive in spite of that. So, Father, I ask that you do that. <laughs> I ask that you forgive my sins, that you give me the righteousness of Jesus, that you come into my life, that you transform me, and that you begin a relationship with me right now. And I'm not bringing in any good works. I'm not bringing any tests that I've passed. I'm not bringing any amazing things that I've done. I'm not bringing in any resume whatsoever. I'm just believing in the name of Jesus Christ. So would you save me in his name? Let's keep our heads bowed and eyes closed. If you prayed that, man, that's amazing. I really encourage you to tell someone about that. Your campus pastors or hosts will explain that. But over all of us, Father, would you help us not forget that you're a God of grace extravagant father now, there's no fear of you ever failing because you've already proved you won't but we walk out of here knowing that and trusting that and that's the name of Jesus we pray amen if you made that decision today I believe it's the best decision that you will ever make but we don't want you to have to do this alone and so if you could let us know, we would love that. There is a feature in the chat for you to raise your hand. Once you've done that, there's an option to connect. And if you can leave your information with us, we'd love to connect directly with you and just walk through what those next steps might look like. Well, as Christ followers, we love to celebrate something called communion on a regular basis. We've seen it modeled by Jesus in the Last Supper. It was there that he said, do this in remembrance of me. And so that's what we do. We gather together, we remember his sacrifice and the impact that that has made in our lives. And we do this at the campuses, but you might be at home and want to do it with friends or family. And so we have the resource for you to use. You can find it at gethope.net slash communion at home. And you can use that resource to have communion right where you are. Well, we are so thankful that you've spent the time with us today, and we hope to see you back next week.